Hey guys, how's it going? Steven, I, I see you just got in here. I think it's just me and you right now, uh, but we'll get this started. Uh, wanted to start off by going, hopefully everything's okay. I'm using a different computer than normal as the normal computer is out of commission for tonight. So using this Chromebook that I've never even used, turned on before today. So hopefully the quality is not that bad. But I uh, wanted to kind of hop into what the new series that I kind of had in play as the teams are looking to open their facilities on Tuesday. But um, uh, the New York Jets will not be part of one of those teams as New Jersey has not started to lift some of those precautions due, due to COVID-19. So uh, we don't know when we'll actually get to start hearing news of the players together and practicing and different things like that. So I wanted to come out with a new series to kind of keep up with some videos and keep some things going while we're waiting for some camp. Andrew, how's it going? So I was reading an article and really did not like what I saw on there. Um, it it kind of motivated me to come up with this new series that we're going to do. And I'm going to go through position groups. I may lump some together. I may put like the skilled position players uh, on offense in, in one category. But I wanted to compare the AFC East teams and rank them. So we'll rank them by quarterbacks. Like I said, maybe we'll ju- maybe we'll split up the running backs and the wide receivers, um, offensive line, and then we'll go into the defense as well. So just something like I said, I was I saw a post on like they ranked what I saw them rank the running backs, I saw them rank the tight ends and the quarterbacks. So I, I was like. Definitely want to um, put that one up. Hey, lights, how's it going? Yeah, Stephen. Um, spoiler alert. Yeah, it's, I will agree with you on the quarterbacks, Jets. Um, but that, that's just something that I want to do. I figure what we can do is um, it also gives us some talking points on these Sundays. I'll come out with at least one or two um, this upcoming week, and that will give us like at least our starting point on the – Sunday live streams, and then obviously we'll hop right into any questions that are coming in. But um, crazy times right now in the NFL as a lot of players are getting arrested and accused of doing crazy things. So definitely wanted to bring that up. It's like they can only handle so much of an offseason. You give them a little extra time by themselves. They don't know what to do, and they're getting into all types of trouble. Um, so we had two Giants players, three, if you want to count the former Giant and, and now Redskin and um, the wide receiver. And then you have Oliver of the Bills getting arrested with DWI, possession of a firearm, well, the illegal possession of a firearm, I believe, as well. So he's going to get suspended without a doubt. I mean – you look at Herndon getting suspended for four games last year for his DWI. He didn't have a gun on him. So you got to think that he's getting at least four games um, right off the bat. The thing is, though, and I was talking with some people earlier today about this, who knows how long. He may not get suspended to start this this year because if the, pro, if the legal system kind of drags out, especially with everything going on, um, you can see him still there for week one potentially against the Jets. So um, – We'll have to see what happens there, but definitely wanted to mention um, about just those three different situations as it's just, man, these guys are just dumb. Like, how do you, like, you have all that money. How do you not have somebody driving you home? Like, pay somebody. That's it. Have one of your buddies come with you. I mean, they just got to be smarter. Just glad it wasn't anybody on the Jets this time. So uh, (laughs) you get those big news out and you're just hoping that it's not your team, which uh, good to hear that it wasn't. We can't afford any suspensions. I'm still hoping that Quinn doesn't get suspended for his stupidity uh, with bringing the gun to the airport, but at least it was a registered gun. It was not loaded. There was no ammunition. Um, so maybe he could just play dumb and say, uh, I was just trying to get home with it, and I I didn't have it you know, properly stored as I was supposed to. So hopefully he can kind of get off with maybe a fine slap on the wrist. The league pays for the cars to drive them anywhere. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense, Andrew. It's just not smart decision-making. I mean, I understand these guys are young and they want to go out and they want to have a good time, but just do it smart. Like, why? Like, Even if the league didn't pay, like you have so much money. 
what do you need to go out and do stupid things like that? Put your life at risk, put other people's lives at risk. It just doesn't make any sense at all. But it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be interesting to see. So if you guys didn't see with the whole teams being able to go back in their facilities starting Tuesday, the NFL has come up with rules that they have to follow as well as they have to follow the state in which their facility is located and their rules as well. So 10 teams are not going to be able to get into their facilities on Tuesday because of the states that they're in. I could not name them all for you. All I know is the most important thing is the Jets are one of those 10 teams. So in order to make things fair, coaches are not allowed to go no matter what team you are. Uh, So this is really like front office staff, things like that, the training staff. The only players allowed in the facility are ones who are rehabbing injuries. So they're trying to make it as fair as possible. Goodell's doing a good job of, of making it as fair as possible. But we have to start getting some people back in. They want to get this schedule off on time. If you look at everything that's come out, they came out with the full s- slate of games. They came out with their preseason schedule and dates. I think they plan on having the schedule right on time. Um, whether we miss some of these mini, a few more of these mini camps, whether they kind of push them back. Um, so they usually had the rookie mini camp and then the other mini camp, and then it's kind of that break for summer before they really come back for um, training camp. So maybe what they do is they try to get one of those actual mini camps in during the summertime. Maybe they just rid of them all together. Uh, I would just say extend training camp one, one week. Or so let them come in a week earlier for training camp. Let them have an extra week of practicing because uh, that gives you the most time to kind of clear everything out, get this whole coronavirus out of here, uh, figure out how they're going to work them into their facilities the right way. So like I said, hopefully that's what it is. I can see us, um, like I said, having a full regular season here. But what, what do you guys got going on here? Steven, give me something. Give me a question. What do you guys got? So I'll bring up the Logan Ryan. So Logan Ryan still is not a Jet. I know me and every other Jets YouTuber, at least that I follow, posted a video that day when Manish Mehta came out and said that we were going to sign him. And a bunch of other people kind of followed suit and said that. And now the rumors come out that we have not even formally offered him a contract. And we're looking, you know, we're still in talks with him. Logan Ryan came out and said he's still open for business. He said that the Jets would be ideal. He's obviously from – he went to Rutgers. He's from the area. So I really hope a deal does get done. I really think that he would fit in perfectly in the Greg Williams system, being able to blitz off the uh, off the slot, do a f- bunch of different things, lining up in different areas. So I think for us, we're waiting for that June 1. But as we've seen, if you haven't seen from Joe Douglas already, he's not going to overpay somebody. He's not. You're not going to hear these things like we heard about Le'Veon Bell's contract where we're bidding against ourselves and we paid way more than anybody else was offered. He's not doing that, right? So we've seen that. He will wait it out um, and, and get him at the price that he wants him at or, he, or he'll move on. So, like I said, we'll, we'll just see what happens with that. I hope he does come in the fold, but – um, like I said, I think June 1 is the date for us. If he's still there, I think that's when we would really make a harder look at him, maybe making a, a formal offer to him once that Tremaine Johnson money is off the books. When are we going to cut some of these linebackers? Andrew, at this point, I just don't think – hey, Todd, just saw you popped in there. I, I don't think that they're going to cut any linebackers now. There's no need to. We have a lot of – so inside linebacker is probably what you're really talking about as our outside linebacker is still a little weak and shallow. So inside linebacker, we have quite a few names. I just, at this point, it doesn't make sense. I think what you do is you go into camp with all these guys. If anybody gets hurt or if some of these guys come back from injury or not 100% yet, you have your you have that protection, that safety behind them. And then I mentioned this a few other times too. I really can see us trading one of those guys to a team that needs an inside linebacker around roster cutdowns. That happens quite a bit where teams will be deeper out of position like we are at middle linebacker, maybe short on – let's just keep it at the linebacker position, say outside linebacker, and then they'll trade an outside linebacker for, for an inside linebacker. Two teams that would have cut two players, they kind of swap them out to fill needs. 
so they don't have to try to get the guy on waivers, things like that. So that's something I can see happening. I think the Jets offered something, but it wasn't close to what he wanted. That's possible, Stephen, but what I, from what I read, it said that there was no formal offer. So maybe they kind of verbally mentioned anything, but I don't, you know, no formal offer was made from anything that I've read at this point for Logan Ryan. No point in signing him. He's 29. Give the younger guys a chance. Can't believe I'm saying this. Yeah, we do have depth now at the cornerback position. Um, I just – I don't want to force any of these guys into playing time right away. That is one thing that does – scare me about bringing in another guy is there's a lot that I think that would be like our 10th corner uh, in my Logan Ryan video. I'd named them all out. I, I, I think there was about 10 of them. Uh, so that's just hard to get reps for all those people. So I understand where you're coming from, Stephen. These young guys are not going to be able to get as much, as much reps as we would like them to. But Logan Ryan's also been around some really, really, really good teams and some really good defenses. And he could be invaluable to those young guys from a mentorship role. We really don't have, I mean, Pierre Desir, but I think Logan Ryan holds more weight than Pierre Desir when it comes to that veteran presence and that leadership in the cornerback room. Because if you think about it, our secondary, there's no leader. I mean, Jamal Adams is a leader, but he's a safety. So when you're looking at the cornerback room, you really have no mentor there. So I can see Logan Ryan just having that added value from that aspect as well. We need the men to pay the rookies. No, we don't. Andrew, we, we still have quite a bit of uh, money against the cap. I can't tell you off the top of my head what it is, but we have enough money to pay the rookie class. Why we haven't signed anybody from the rookie class yet, I'm not sure. I heard some rookies are just kind of waiting to see what happens. I don't know why, um, but I'm not worried about it. They'll get these guys signed. They'll get them in the building once anybody can get in the building. I think they signed or re-signed all these linebackers because we have three of them coming back from injury. Yeah, that's exactly what I was just talking about. See, um, so many injuries, you just don't know what can happen, and you want to make sure that you have that flexibility. Um, and that's that, that's the biggest thing with the whole coronavirus. They haven't been able to get a look at Avery Williamson. They haven't been able to get a look at CJ Mosley. They're doctors, right? I'm sure they could get reports from whoever those two guys are seeing, and even Blake Cashman. But until their own doctors and a team um, can get a look at them, there's going to be question marks as to where exactly are they in the timeline. And also, are they going to be full strength right away? Are they going to be able to take the reps that needed in practice? So you also need to bring in some of these other guys just to take some reps, right, at the, at the position. I can see maybe one or two of these guys being on the practice squad. Um, so you want to keep them around, keep them in the house, let them learn, and then hopefully you can sneak them on into the practice squad um, for just some added depth as well. But they did increase the roster space by two two spots this year, so that'll probably get us an extra inside linebacker to make the team. They're all still not going to make it. I hope Williamson makes it. I hope they keep Williamson. At this point, I really don't think that they need the money for anything in particular. Um, I think that they have other ways they can get extra money if they wanted to. You can still cut winters. But I wanted to see, and I was so pumped up to see C.J. Mosley and Avery Williamson play together. Um, I, I was very, very high on Williamson. I think he's one of the most underrated linebackers in the league. Um, and C.J. Mosley is one of the best linebackers in the league. So we'd easily have the best inside linebacking core in the league. Um with Williamson and Mosley. So just would be really, really excited to see them be able to play together, but we'll see what happens. Smash the like. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, guys, we got 10 in here and four likes. So let's get, let's try to get that up a little bit. I didn't like the publicity stunt he pulled. Don't sign him. Uh, we talking about Logan Ryan. I'm not sure publicity stunt. Um, hey, B.O. Uh, welcome. Hit the like. It happens every year. I know the contracts are slotted, but they don't sign until the guys or guys behind them in front of them. Yeah, it, it's tough. I, you know what's going to get done, especially since, ever since they put in that pay scale and they're slotted. It, it gets done very rarely. Would it, it was maybe three since that happened that didn't get done before like training camp. So I'm not worried about these guys getting in there. Uh, a lot of it's just always offset language, which for me as a team, like, I understand you want to keep 
cap flexibility as much as possible. But it's like you need your young guys in there and and learning and practicing. You don't want them missing times. You have to make sure that they're in there learning, right? And the thing is you have to have faith in yourself. So it's like why are you worried about offset language? The only time the offset language is going to come in is if you pick somebody that's no good and that you're trying to get rid of before that rookie deal is over. We're hoping that that doesn't happen very often, especially with the high first-round pick guys like that that are making money that would be significant on the cap. So I don't think it's as big a deal as they make it sometimes when certain teams just stick to their guns and they say, hey, we always put offset language in and we don't care. Um, it's just at the end of the day, it's hopefully you draft them well enough that it, it's a non-factor. Yeah, that, that always happens, Stephen. They're always waiting for one domino to fall, just like free agency. You, there, there's the the big name guy up top. Um, everybody's waiting to see where he goes, and then they kind of fall suit be, behind that because it's just it's leverage. It's a leverage game. So if you're Quinn and Williams in that example, and the other D lineman got picked before you, and you don't think they're offering you fair value or or the incentives that you want, you're going to wait because then if they get it, you're going to use that as leverage to try to get it for yourself. So it makes sense, but then it could also backfire on you too because if you were trying to get no offset language because you want to be able to get double dip potentially if they cut you, and then Nick Boza gets offset language, well now you kind of lose your leg to stand on a little bit. So it can backfire on you as well, but people do that a lot. It's just it's the nature of the business. They're going to wait to see what's best and, and what they can get. So, I, like I said, I don't know how many people have even signed. I, I, I've heard of – let me see. I know two have signed. Uh, but other than Tua, I don't know if I've heard of anyone that's signed yet. So this year, it's just a lot different. I mean, I remember before the rookie pay scale, the number one pick would sometimes get signed before the draft because they were so worried about the fact that they could command whatever they wanted and refuse to sign um, that teams would try to negotiate beforehand to say, hey, can we even get this guy signed? So now with the rookie pay scales, um, you don't see those coming out before the draft. Um, and they usually happen a little while after. But it just – you would think that during these times and everything going on that these players would want to sign sooner rather than later. I don't understand the reason to hold out. Um, I'd want to sign and get my signing bonus, right? I'd be like, hey, I need money. Uh, you know, Maybe my family needs money because they're out of work right now. Um so I don't know. It doesn't make that much sense. But again, at the end of the day, I don't think it's a big deal. So let me let me try to see if I could pull up one over the cap here. How much how much money we have? I think, if I'm not mistaken, our rookie was like between eight eight to eleven million. I think is what we needed to pay all the rookies. But let's see what they have on here. Says our team cap space is just under 15 million right now. So we should be fine to sign them. We still have a little extra cash. Again, Winters would save 7 million if you cut them right on the spot. Um, Nate Harrison can save 2 million if you wanted to uh, get rid of him to clear up a, a spot in that cornerback room. You know, and then Williamson, how much money do you save on Williamson? Let's see. Williamson, you save six and a half million. So they can, they can definitely clear up some space if they wanted to. How much to sign the draft class? Yeah, I think it's between eight and 11. I want to see if I can find it right here. Um, it's It said before it. Yeah, six and a half. Are you guys going to have a special guest on future shows? Yeah, I mean, I would love to. Uh, we'll see if we can get it set up. I've been talking with, um, but I know that I'm going to be on the bottom of his totem pole. I was trying to get, I was actually trying to go onto his channel 
But uh, I was talking with Christy and Tanner because he came out with that Jets comparison between um, the quarterbacks and, and comparing teams. And I, I told him that I think it would be a really cool segment if we could get a Jets and Giants YouTuber to kind of, you know, playfully debate back to two New York teams because uh, Buffalo is not a New York team. They're Canada's team. So we don't count them. But um, – and I thought it would be cool to have one. I, I've asked some of the guys from the panel if they ever wanted to come on or if, uh, or if they wanted me to come on. So I'm sure we'll have some some clubs in the future. I think it's just tough right now because I have a smaller following base. So these guys who have thousands of subscribers, I just don't think they see the value and bring me on. But it is what it is. I'm having fun with it. You guys are here. Um, love having you guys here. So – if it happens, it happens, but I'm at the point where I'm not action anymore. Um, I want to do my own thing for right now. I, I asked a few times, and it's all right. But I tell you what, if you guys want to see me on, like, the panel or anything like that, just let Ryan know on Monday nights when he does the show. Blow up that live chat and ju just tell him that you guys want to see me. Because, uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm not going to approach him anymore. Um, if it happens, it happens at this point. Uh, cause I don't want to make it seem like I'm desperate to try to get followers. Cause that's not what I'm even here for. Like I said, I don't care if I ever make money off this or not, or how long I even do it for. I'm just going to have fun while I'm doing it. Uh, and if it goes anywhere, it goes anywhere, but you guys are the best man. I, it's the same few people coming every Sunday. I really appreciate it. Um, so that, that is with that. Was there anybody particular that you'd want to see Todd? on a future show, let me know. But um, so for anybody that didn't hear in the beginning, uh, because I think it was only me, Steven, and like maybe one other person when I mentioned it, the next series I'm going to do on my channel is a, I'm going to break down and compare some of the position groups for the AFC East. So we'll go through quarterback. We'll go through – I haven't decided if I'm doing running back, wide receiver, tight end all separately or if I'm going to just do skill position um, to – not making so many videos, but uh, we'll see. And then we're going to rank them one through four in the division. I'm going to try to be as unbiased as possible. Um, so just letting you guys know right now, the Jets are not going to be number one in every category, right? Offense line, they're absolutely not going to be number one. I think that they're moving up the ranks, but um, we'll, we'll see where they are when I do a little more research into some of the other guys. Hey, Brandon, how's it going? No, no problem that you late, man. Um, like I said, we would just kind of catch it up on some stupidity of some of these players in the league, talking about um, some of the different position groups and how I'm going to be going through videos on that. You know, reach out to another small child. Yeah, I thought about that, Todd. Um, like I said, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I would definitely be up for it. I really like interacting with people. And that's why I like this more than when I make the videos because uh, it's just – it's better. It's not you just – talking to a camera you're actually interacting with people now does buffalo have the best wide receivers so steven should i answer that question or should i make you wait until i get the video up um best wide receivers in the division i tell you what the wide receiver is going to be one of the toughest ones to do this year uh because i think a lot can change from going into the year to the end of the year and that's what i'll say if you know what's good for you to answer now. That, that's what I'll tell you. I think the rankings that are going to be the beginning of the year are not going to be the same as at the end of the year. Because if And I'll give you a little preview. If you look at some of these wide receivers in this division, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of flashes. So it's going to be hard to really rank them. You look at um, Parker in Miami, all the talent in the world – to be, I think, a top-tier receiver in the league. Um, if he can string it all together, you have uh, the Jets. You know, I think Perryman, what he showed in that last six games, is more in line with what he can actually do, right? So, But you can't put him up there because he hasn't done it yet, right? So there's a lot of potential, but it's who's going to show it. Mims, right? Mims has a lot of potential. Is he going to be able to show it? Is he going to be able to make an impact right away? 
year one. That's something that we'll have to wait and see. The only one I would fully trust is Parker. Yeah, and I'm not huge on on Diggs. I mean, Dig, I mean Diggs is a very good receiver, but he's not. I wouldn't say he's elite caliber wide receiver one. I'd say he's low end wide receiver one, a high end wide receiver two. So he also has a quarterback that can't th- can't throw accurately uh, deep down the field. So that'll be fun to watch. Gay said Perryman is perfect for a system. Yeah, well, I mean Perryman's not much. They're not much different than than Robbie. I think Perryman's going to have a, a big year. Uh, I really do. Uh, if you look at so let's, we'll talk about Perryman for a little bit here. If you look at Perryman's career, he I can see what happened in the beginning, and to see where he finished last year shows just how hard of a worker he is and how mentally strong he is at least now. Um, and he even mentioned this too. I heard him. I don't know who he's talking to. I can't remember at this point, but. The beginning of his career was riddled with injuries and he did have some bad drops at some point, you know, early in his career. So when you're looking at that, it, it's tough. You have that first round pedigree where people thought maybe you got drafted a little higher because you, you're combine than where you should have been. You get hurt in your, your rookie year. You miss the whole year. You come back, you kind of banged up a little bit. You have a few drops. His, confidence was really really low and he and he spoke about that and he spoke about how he kind of had to get himself right and get himself back but I mean the the, the talent was there and you watch some of those catches that he made and some of the plays that he made on some of the balls that's talent that's skill he was going up and making really nice catches Um, he was getting separation he came down with one in the back of the end zone Um, obviously most of his stuff was towards the end of the year where it was just a really, really nice catch. So you see that, that that's talent. It's not like all, all of a sudden like he just got lucky. In the beginning of the year, he was way, way down the depth chart. You had Mike Evans. You had Godson who burst onto the scene. And he just wasn't – this. you know, you can only throw to so many people. And Evans and Godson were catching like 10 passes a game. So – you know, you can see why he wasn't doing anything in the beginning. It's not that he wasn't talented enough. It's just that there was too many other weapons there. Once they kind of went down with injury, he was able to really shine. So I think he is going to develop into some. I, I'm i hoping if he develops the way I think he develops, I'm hoping we re-sign him midseason because I think that that could be something we don't want it to drag out to free agency again. Diggs is on a new team and in a new system. Who knows how he'll play? Yeah. Exactly. Like I said, I don't I don't know if I'm as sold on Diggs as everybody else. Like I said, I think he's a very good receiver. Is he a top echelon guy? I'm not I'm not sure. I don't think so. I said I think that they just had a really, really good tandem there with, with him and Thielen. And they were passing quite a bit. So it was just those two were like neck and neck with each other. So they just had two really good top receivers. I think it's kind of like with – and I like Decker, but uh, Decker had that really big year with Brandon Marshall. They they were both kind of playing off each other extremely well, which made Decker have a better year than he really had anywhere else. So that's kind of what happens when you have other talent around you. It kind of helps to elevate you, helps to take some attention off of you, right? So the thing is with the Bills, they're going to have a lot of speed when it comes to wide receiver because uh, they still have John Brown, I believe, as well. So – um, we'll just see, though. I mean, it doesn't matter if Allen doesn't fix his accuracy issues. But that that's why that wide receiver position is going to be difficult and can be drastically different from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. But we will see what happens. So I'm going to start talking about it. You guys let me know in the chat here. Let's go offense, and then we'll go defense, and we'll say biggest need still on the offense, biggest need still on the defense. So I think offense, you're going to look at there, – there's really two positions. It's it's going to be guard and wide receiver depth um, because you go into it, Perryman's had injury issues. Uh, Crowder was healthy last year, was had injury issues. Backup quarterback too, Todd. Yeah, I, I do agree, and I think they are going to address that. If you guys didn't see the deal that Fails got, I mean, it only cost us like a hundred thousand. 
if we cut him. So it's essentially a non-guaranteed deal. So I can definitely see them bringing in somebody to back up Sam. And I think it'll help Sam. You want to get a veteran in there. Like I said, I've been saying Matt Moore all year. I think Matt Moore would be a great backup for Sam Darnold. Um, he knows Gase's system. So with everything going on with the offseason, it's not that big of a deal. He can come in and not really miss a beat. Something about Mims Perryman, uh, Crowder, Herndon, Bell gets me all warm and fuzzy. You didn't even mention um, Griffin either. Uh, Griffin's going to play a big role as well. I want to see a lot of two tight end sets. And Herndon, people are sleeping on Herndon. They're forgetting about Herndon. He is going to have a breakout year. I think that if Herndon is healthy, he will be considered a top 10 tight end by the end of the season. You heard it here first. On paper, the whole team looks pretty good. I'm worried how they're all going to get gel with minimum time together before the season. Yeah, Braden, the biggest – component that is the offensive line because you're going to have five guys who have never played together. So Alex Lewis or Winters, whoever kind of is still on the team playing this one starting guard position will be a returner from last year, but the guys next to them will be completely new. So none of the guys, none of the five on the offensive line will have ever played a snap next to the other one before. So that is going to be difficult. Hopefully we don't miss time practice time. Like I said, that's why I'm hoping that maybe they just, Instead, since we're missing these mini camps, maybe just have them go back to training camp a week early, uh, put an extra week of just practices so we can get these guys kind of working together and working through it. But that's going to be a big thing, and that's why it kind of sucks to have the Bills week one uh, because we got to get this team gelling. But um, we'll see what happens. I mean, everybody's going to miss it. I know we're having – we have a lot of new bodies, so it's going to hurt us a little more than other teams. But at least Goodell is making it pretty straightforward and pretty um, fair for everybody. Like, like I said, even the teams that are going to be reporting on Tuesday, it's just really going to be their front office staff. They're not – no coaches are allowed in the building. They're, none of the players are allowed in the building unless they're rehabbing injuries. So we'll see what happens. But the starting offensive line is definitely going to be an area where we have to see early on um, how they're going to be able to work together with this offseason that we've had. Dogs need the ball, or uh, I'm assuming that man Diggs needs the ball, or he acts like a baby. Not good thing for Josh Allen. Yeah, no, Diggs has definitely shown that with and his cryptic text tweets and things like that. The one thing I, I got to say that I was that I saw from Josh Allen that who knows, Donald could be doing it too. Uh, just not in the spotlight, but you saw Allen got together with those two rookie receivers. Um, Isaiah Hodgins, sorry, light. I know we don't like that he's there, but uh, and um, was it Davis, the other wide receiver they drafted, Gabriel Davis, or something like that? Um, and he was working, and the running back that they drafted, he was working out with all those guys. So I'm hoping that Sam's been able to get some of that work in, uh, as well with some of these guys. Cause I, I know I saw the video of him, but it was like a five-second clip of him just with some footwork in the sand and then threw a ball deep to – you couldn't even tell who it was. It was so far away. But um, hopefully he's able to get some work in with some of our guys too while we, we kind of wait for him to be able to get back to the facility. I thought Herndon would be a top five tight end last season before he got hurt. I still think he can be. Yeah. And too many people are making up about what, what he did. I mean, he got caught with a DUI. Uh, right after he got drafted. So that means his whole rookie year, he didn't get caught with anything else. His whole second year, he didn't get caught with anything. He just served that suspension at the beginning of his second year then had the unfortunate injuries um, that derailed his career, his season. So hopefully he can get back to, you know, playing, build back up that chemistry with Donald because they were really, really starting to get something going there. Steven, offensive line, Beckton, Clark, McGovern, Ben Roten, Fant. That is my hopeful projected starting five. I would love to see Beckton and Clark right next to each other. They've spoken about how they became really good friends throughout the whole offseason programs uh, leading up to the combine and training. I think they were training with the same guy. So they're, they've kept in 
they became friends throughout that process training for the draft. So it was really cool that we got them both. They're both very, very nasty. And whether this is the left side of the line this year or hopefully ne- uh, by the latest next year, I think putting those two right next to each other, forget about it. They'll be road graders. We should have one of the better run-blocking left side of the line in all of football. They just both want to throw people around and pancake them. and So that would be really, really fun to watch those two playing next to each other. Uh, you didn't have to remind me. Now I'm pissed off. Over you. Sorry, lights. Yeah, no, I just uh, I saw the video and um, I was just I was thinking the same thing. I was like, man, I, I wish he was. I wish he was standing next to Sam Darnold right now. But um, it'll be interesting. Did you guys see that Chubb? Because now I'm just thinking wide receivers, and I just want to understand. Chubb said that if he was picking a fantasy team, he would draft. Jarvis Landry over Odell Beckham Jr. And I thought that was an interesting answer. I mean, I, I I think that was a question he probably should have dodged and just not answered at all. But um, wonder why he says that. Um, does he know something we don't know? Um, or does he just think Landry's better than Odell? Uh, but I just thought that, that was kind of interesting. And like I said, interesting that he even answered it. Um, and then try to just get around it and say they should both be drafted very highly or something like that. So, what do you guys what do you guys think about the new series? What position group do you guys want to see me start out with? Oh, lights! Did you not see that? Was that wow about uh, the Landry over Odell? Yeah, yeah. Just I just saw. I think it was earlier today. I saw it. So, let's see. Where, where's my notes here? We're gonna go back to because we never went through it fully. Um, I want to go over some of the things that are in the schedule that. Kind of get me going. I think you should start with the O lines. Yeah, great. Lights picked the most difficult one. <laughs> o line is just always the hardest because they're uh, it's harder to see. You know, you really need to know what you're talking about when you're evaluating offensive lines. Um, that was when I was looking forward to doing the least. But um, if you guys want it, I'll definitely give it my best role. Like I said, I'm not going to put the Jets. Um, towards the top because it's just going to take some time to mesh. I still got to look. I mean, I couldn't even – the Dolphins offensive line, I mean, I, I know they have – I think they sell one of the Pouncey brothers, right? I don't know anybody else that they may have on that. So they have to do some research into it. Just do two position groups, quarterbacks, and <laughs> Steven just wants the ones that were top. That's it. Don't, don't name any other ones. Um, kick returner or punt returner. So is that – Todd, is that a question of who do I think our kick returner and punt returner is going to be this upcoming year? Because uh, if it is, I think kick returner, punt returner, you're looking at the people that are going to be in contention. I think P. Ron did a little return work in, with Florida. Also, um, Davis. I think Davis is going to return punts for us. Kick, kickoff return, it almost doesn't even matter anymore. I, I hate that they changed all these rules. I mean, I understand they're trying to keep the players safe. But, man, kick return was one of the most exciting plays. You used to see those guys run them back, and especially Dante Hall. I mean, he was unbelievable. But now with with the kickoffs being adjusted so much, they, they rarely return them anymore anyway. Usually they don't even catch them anymore. They just let the ball go out the back of the end zone. So – but I think Davis and P. Ryan, that's why I said uh, Braxton Berrios is probably going to be gone. Um, I don't think he makes a team because I think he loses out his return job, and I don't think he provides much value as a wide receiver. Brad Smith against the Steelers. Yeah, uh, we, had, we had some really good returners. Brad Smith had, had some very nice returns. Leon Washington, Justin Miller. We had, we had some pretty good return men. So 
So what are your guys' Ross uh, predictions for this upcoming year? I'm pulling up the schedule again. I I have it here, but uh, there was a few quirks in it. So we go to the West Coast for back-to-back games towards the end of the year, Seattle and L.A. And apparently the Jets – requested actually Joe Douglas in particular because they did this with some of the other teams that he had played for they had requested for those games to be back to back because they are going to stay out on the west coast so that'll help them with a little less travel time it also helped them to stay adjusted to the time over there but um we look at it and you know right out the gate two tough games two two playoff teams with the Bills and the 49ers. I think I think we take one of them, whatever one it is. Uh, you guys are missing the X factor about going to play on the West Coast. San Antonio's going to want to show off. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's going to feel more at home, obviously, for sure. Um, tough schedule, hoping 8-8-ish. Eight and eight-ish. I think, yes, yeah, so the tough schedule thing, you know, I'm not a big believer in that. Because, like I said, anything can happen. There's teams every year that do a little bit – that surprise us both ways, right? Surprise us doing a lot better than expected. Surprise do a lot worse than expected, right? And then you could always have something like – look at the Indianapolis Colts, right? You would have said that the year that they ended up getting the number one overall pick to draft Andrew Luck, if you were coming into that year playing the Colts on your schedule, you'd be like, that's a really hard game. Peyton Manning goes down with a neck injury and they're a horrible team that had the first pick in the draft. So anything like that can happen, right? Or you could even have players that are getting hurt in, in game, things like that. So you never know what can happen. So the whole easier, harder doesn't really mean much at the beginning of the year. We also have the Patriots on our schedule twice, which last year they were a 12 win team this year. I highly doubt it. Right. So you have to look at that and, and weigh it out. Um, because it's not it's not just so cut and dry, oh, well, we have the second or third hardest schedule in the league, so we're going to be bad, right? And then also you got to look at it, right? The 49ers, like like to saying, we could probably upset them. So the factors that make me think we could upset them, one, it's early in the year. Anything can happen early in the year. These teams are still trying to get their wheels spinning, trying to get the team on, under them, right? Two, they're coming all the way across to us. And I think it's a one o'clock game, which is always tougher for the West Coast teams because it's earlier in their time, obviously. And three, if you look at it, their defense is very good, right? So our offense is going to have to show that they can move the ball and score on the 49ers. But what is the 49ers good for on, on offense? Running the ball. And we were second in the league in run defense last year without C.J. Mosley. So I think you insert C.J. Mosley back in there. You insert Avery Williamson potentially back in there who are both excellent run defending inside linebackers and you stop that running attack and force Jimmy G to throw, we have a chance for sure. I don't think that they're unbeatable. Plus if you look at it just a year before they were like a three win team. I know Jimmy G got hurt, but Jimmy G's not even that good. He's a game manager, right? So anything can happen. I think the 49ers are going to have a little step back this year. I don't think that they make it, even to the uh, NFC Championship game this year. Um, did they make the playoffs? Maybe, but they may be a one and done this year in the playoffs. Chargers are starting a rookie. By the time we play them, when do we play them? Week six? He may be starting by then. Yeah, I mean, he'll probably start out, out of the gate because Tyrod Taylor, he's not very good. How tough a schedule is can be tough to evaluate because injuries. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that, that's just part of it, and that's why it's hard to – and that's why, you know, I know um, – what's his name? Tyson Roush over at Let's Talk Jets Radio. He, he said it perfectly. He's like, he said he does not do predictions, uh, record predictions. He said he looks at the first four games and he looks at, and he predicts those. Because he said after the first four games, it's a crapshoot, right? Because you don't know. With all the injuries – people that play better than, that, than they're supposed to, people that are rookies that make immediate impacts versus rookies that were thought to make immediate impacts that don't. So there's a lot of different things that can change. 
Um, so it is hard to project, and obviously we're all just guessing at this point. I had us. I think we could be nine, nine to ten win team without a doubt. Um, because when you have an elite defense like I think we will have, you're going to be in these games, uh, and that's that's just what it is. And now if the offense just makes that step forward, if this offensive line, the biggest thing to be is this offensive line gelling. Because I think Sam Donald, if this offensive line gels, he's going to put up a very, very good year. Overall offensive line will have their shit to get by week two. Yeah, they're going to have to because that 49ers front is very good. Show the video before. Um, Ten wins gets us in with seven playoff spots, nine sevens hit or miss. Ten wins could win us the division too. I mean, we could be tied at ten and ten with uh, ten and six with a Buffalo or somebody like that. Ten wins can can definitely win you this division, especially when our division as a whole. If you want to look at the harder schedule, right, barring major injuries, we are playing some of the better divisions in the league this year. So the the, our division as a whole, is there a 12-win team, 11-win team in this division? It may not happen this year. Yeah, like I say, nine wins could win too. I mean, we've seen eight wins win a division before. I don't think that'll be this division this year. But uh, nine or ten wins can, can easily win you the division for sure. So it's just going to be, you know, see what happens here. I think that we have – the way that our schedule lays out, I think it's pretty good. The end of the year, though, we have a lot of games that are going to be very, very important. Um, just like anything, I, I'm just saying, like, the Ra- the Raiders and the Browns are two games that could weigh huge at the end of the year. Raiders, Browns, and then even, even the Pats in Week 17. Because the Raiders and Browns could potentially be competing with us for a wild card if we're not – if we're not – competing for the division title ourselves. So getting those head, head-to-head matchups so late in the year is going to be really, really important for this team. Buffalo is overrated, but they're going to win 10 games. They're definitely overrated. I think that, like you said, you just look at some of the games. I, I'm just not, you know, I'm not sold on on them yet. The quarterback position is the most important position, and Allen cannot just continuously run um, to help him out. He has to use that running when when it's given to him, but he has to be able to sit back there and make those throws as well. So that's going to be something that he needs to make that leap and make that step forward, just like Sam's got to make a step forward too. I mean, these guys are only entering their third year. Um, So it's all about – making sure that they continue to develop because if Josh Allen doesn't make a leap with his accuracy, I, I think Buffalo takes a step back instead of a step forward. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what would happen um, with with him. I will say though that Lamar Jackson surprised me a little bit last year with the step up he made as far as his accuracy went. And so it can happen. Um, but I don't know. How do you guys feel that, Josh Allen and Sam Donald are such good friends, and they're always training together. I don't know if I like it or not. Like, it's just weird. Like that he got drafted to Buffalo, and we're in the same division, and they're like really good friends. It's like you never saw Michael Jordan like doing that with anybody. Um, it's just, I wish that I don't know, man. Maybe maybe it gives them a little more of a, that competitiveness with each other, but. I wouldn't want like, them helping each other. You know, it's just, I don't know. To me, like I said, it's just, especially at that position, in division rival, it's just, Sam better not be teaching him how to throw. Yeah, he should be giving him pointers over there. I, got, I don't know. Give him the wrong pointers. You know? <laughs> You're doing great, Josh. You're doing great. Keep that up. <laughs> but, this division is going to be interesting this year. I think that there's a lot of question marks all throughout all four of these teams. And it's going to be something where any one of these teams can surprise and any one of these teams can, you know, disappoint for sure. So because you even look at Miami, if Tua comes out and is healthy and plays as well as people think thinks he can, 
you know, he can surprise and get more wins than they thought. If Tua stays, I tell you what, if Tua has an injury risk, injury history, and that injury concern does not pan out well for Miami, their draft is going to go down the hill too quickly. Because I don't really like what they did after Tua very much. Um, I think they recent reached on Austin Jackson. I, If I was them, I would have probably, and who knows, maybe they tried to. I would have probably tried to trade up and draft one of the top four guys as opposed to wait back there, take Austin Jackson. Then you take a corner that you didn't need because you have the two highest paid corners in the league. So why are you drafting another corner in the first round? I would have used that capital to get up and get a better offensive lineman. But um, it'll be interesting to, to see what Miami does and how. Uh, I mean, Flores did a, a very good job last year. Let's see if he can translate that into a year or two and continue to improve them. But this division is going to be interesting to watch for sure. Lamar Jackson runs too much. He will eventually get blasted and miss some time. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, you look at Michael Vick, right? Um, the thing is, Lamar Jackson does know when to get down, when to get out. He doesn't take huge, huge hits, but it that's not sustainable, right? You can't be running for a thousand yards. You can't, you can't be doing all that. You're you're a quarterback. You got to be back in the pocket. You got to be making those throws, and that's what happens too. Like. You have to be able to, and he, he just like all the quarterbacks in the draft class, needs to continue to improve because when you get to the games late in the year, when you get to the games in the playoffs, everything becomes tighter. These defenses become better, and you have to be able to win from the pocket, and that's it. So he has to show that he can continue to get better in the pocket and not have to rely on his legs as much as he did last year. I think with the short and preseason, I think sloppy play first four games if the Jets can just be a little tighter on the control more than other opponents, they can get a chance at 2 0 start. Yeah, that can definitely happen, Todd. Like I said, I, I can see us winning the first two games for sure. It's not going to be easy, but there's no game besides. Let me see here. Let me just double check. Yeah, the only game that I really see us like having so much difficulty that I would be kind of surprised that we won is. I don't think we're ready to beat the Chiefs yet, especially in Kansas City. Other than that, maybe Seattle and Seattle as well. But Seattle, they're like one of those weird teams. Was like Russell Wilson's really good, but like who else really scares you? The defense has kind of been like shuffling around now. They're not what they used to be when they were winning when they won the Super Bowl. So I, I I'm going to give them the the edge there. But if we beat any team really on our schedule, I wouldn't be a hundred percent shocked except for Kansas City in Kansas City and the main reason for that is our corners just are not ready to play that kind of offense right now and I think that they have a really hard time covering those guys hip injuries are very tricky I wouldn't have touched to a yeah but a lot, a lot of reports came back that he was clean I mean somebody was going to take a gamble on him at some point uh, when you have three first round picks you can kind of do that because really, if you look at it, if Tua doesn't pan out and those other two guys do, I mean, it's still going to you know suck that they wasted a high pick like that on somebody that didn't pan out, but they still at least got two other players in the first round. So if you can hit on those other two, you still came out with two really good players in, the, in, in a draft. I don't think that they will. I didn't like the two people that they picked, um, especially, you know, like I said, picking the corner. That just didn't make sense. Josh got nervous around Jets defense. Put some serious hits pressure on him. Yeah, we definitely did. And Mosley was wreaking havoc on him. Um, he couldn't figure out where Mosley was, what he was doing. And that's why, like, losing Mosley that game, having him go down, I mean, they couldn't even move the ball on us when, when he was in there. Uh, so that's what I said. I want to see Mosley healthy for a full year um, with – Jamal Adams, I think that that's going to just be insane. Insane. Because you saw it for, what was it, two and a half quarters uh, against Buffalo. It was really, really exciting. So you you look at that defense, and this is why, like I said, I'm very, very optimistic about a lot of these games. The defensive line, we've had a very good defensive line for a very long time. We just don't have that elite edge rusher. But you have Foley, Fatukasi. You have McClendon in that nose tackle spot. Then you have Shepard. You have Quinn and Williams. You have 
Henry Anderson, um, Phillips, who came on the scene from nowhere, undrafted free agent last year. That defensive line is going to be very, very good. It's very deep. They're going to be able to rotate in, keep everybody fresh. We have the best safety tandem in the league. We have a all pro inside linebacker coming back. Uh, what I think is another Pro Bowl caliber inside linebacker in Avery Williamson if he stays on this team. So there's a lot of talent. The cornerback position is not really up to snuff with the rest of the defense, but if you bring in Logan Ryan, you have one of the best slot corners in the game. Um, Logan Ryan's also a very good slot corner who can play outside. You have Desir, who's probably a you know t- number two corner, right? So you just have some depth there where you can kind of rotate these guys in. But with the safeties that you have, it kind of helped mass that a little bit. Just have got to be more consistent and disciplined until I see that. I don't know what to expect. Yeah, uh, get my Bob. And if you watch what Joe Douglas did in the offseason, he feels the same way. Uh, he brought in these linemen who don't commit penalties. I think the three the, – all the offensive linemen he brought in, they commit like one or two holding penalties all of last season. So he sees that as an issue. Um, corners and offensive line killed us last year in penalties. And that's why I don't want Alex Lewis starting. I would rather have Clark start or I'd even even rather have Winter start. If somebody can just tell Winters that he has to let us know when he gets hurt. Because if he tries to play hurt, he's going to get San Donald killed. Um, so I just don't want to see Lewis and – you know, he commits too many penalties. I like his nastiness. I like how hard he works, but he's just not good enough. And it, and it showed last year. He's a good backup to have. He can spell if he has to. But once you start getting him to play um, a larger role, he gets exposed. You see all the penalties, and he's just not good enough. I really don't want him on this starting offensive line this year. I really don't. I wonder if they would even try to put Harrison at guard. Um, I don't know how Harrison will potentially feel about that, but I, like I said, I just don't want Lewis um, starting if we don't have to. Or I at least want him competing with somebody to for that spot. Don't hand him anything. We need a kicker. Lost three games because of this last year. Yeah, Andrew, uh, we have two on the roster right now, so I don't see us going out and getting another one right now. What I think will happen is they're going to go into camp with these two. I think – Maher is the front runner to win the job. If one of the two struggles, I can see them getting cut and then somebody else coming in to compete. But for right now, you're not going to, you're not going to waste another roster spot on a third kicker. It's just not happening. So I don't see anybody coming in right now, but um, I think that they will could have a short leash with either one of them, whoever kind of shows a really slow if one of them shows a really slow sh- start to training camp uh with everything that went on last year i don't i don't think they're going to hesitate to get rid of somebody and try to bring somebody else in here so hopefully we don't sign a kicker right before the first game uh, and have him kick for us like we did last year cuz that didn't work out so well for us um, but i tell you what uh ravens what a steal they uh they bring him in, trade him for what was it, a fifth round pick, and then the guy gets cut like a week later. So they got a free pick for nothing. Um, that was pretty impressive. But um, Harrison earned his the spot. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Harrison is really well liked among the team. There was reports that came out way after the fact that the team was not happy um, when oh, I can't think of his name. Wheel came in and just took his spot. They all wanted Harrison in there because he had worked very hard, um, and they showed that he wanted the job, and they felt like he earned it. So Harrison has the respect of the locker room. At least that's what it seems like. He seems like a very good guy, too. He's definitely going to be on this team as a backup center guard, but I would see if he was willing to do it, if they think he can make the switch and have him compete for one of those guard spots because McGovern's your center. You paid him to be your starter. He's going to be your center. Why does everyone forget about Wilson, the DB we traded for? What do you think? So, Kimmo, I think the the reason people don't say much about Wilson, and I didn't do much research on him, he, I think he was banged up last year, but he had a 
horrendous PFF score last year. Um, the year before was not very good either, um, but it was better. I think it was in the 60s the year before that. I mean, the guy's got potential. He's got a chance. He, he was a second-round pick. Um, I would rather take taking a pick with some, on somebody at that spot, but – it's all about, hey, if Greg Williams is like, I want this guy, then I'm all for it. Let's see what he's going to do. Like I said, the toughest thing, Bob, is going to be is going to be the fact that getting all these corner traps, that's going to be tough. Whoever wants that job is going to have to show out early to get more reps, and that's what it's going to be because there's just so many people that if you're not impressing early on, you're going to get lost in the shuffle. So we'll see what happens with them. Um, somebody I'm going to keep my eye on during – the preseason to see what we can do. Cornerbacks a spot where we're really going to have to just watch these guys and see what to do. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they even rank these guys, like the first preseason game coming out and how they come out. I'm not worried about Tua. He will be the next name is talented, but always hurt. Can't wait for football to watch the Jets soar. Yeah, uh, that's what we mentioned with, with Tua. It's just that's a big injury risk. Um, I didn't think that they were going to do it. Um, I didn't. But because then you heard the rumors that they were going to go, they were trying to trade up for an offensive tackle and like maybe they'll do what I think is the right way and just build up the offensive line first. Um, that's what I really think teams rebuilding teams should do. I know you're always, if you don't have your quarterback, you're always trying to get your quarterback and that's your number one goal is you have to get your franchise quarterback. But um, you also want to make sure that they're set up to succeed. So, um, having them come in right away. Sometimes if your team is not ready, you know, you, you have things like, you know, last year when Sam Donald was running for his life because our offensive line just wasn't built up the right way. So I would have been, you know, I, I would not have been surprised if the Dolphins went with a tackle in their first pick. And I was looking out for that, but Hey, it helps us. So I'll take it. June one cuts still to come. Are there, any possible that we could be interested in. I'm not sure. Um, I haven't looked around, but I think that's what Joe Douglas is kind of waiting for too, with cutting some of these other players and why he's not actively going to bring in people right away or overpay people right, right now, because you don't want to pay somebody right now. And then somebody else gets kind of cut or shakes loose from a team that, you know, you maybe would have liked a little bit more. So right now, there's really no rush. Nobody's getting signed anywhere. So I think they're going to keep that flexibility up, and Bob, to whether it be a June 1 cut, whether it be a training camp cut, they're going to try to keep some flexibility to work that wire. Like, you know, Douglas has said it quite a few times since he took over. You're always constantly looking to improve this roster, um, always working the wire, doing different things like that. So um, as we start to hear some of those names get cut, I'll definitely make videos if I think there's somebody that um, – can help this team out and somebody that the Jets should be targeting. Uh, but it'll be, like I said, there's, there's going to be a few different times where some players will shake loose and they could potentially have um, impact for the Jets if we were to bring them in. So we'll, we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Do you think Quinn and Williams will improve? I absolutely think Quinn and Williams will improve. The transition on the defensive line is tough enough as it is. Then when you have lower leg injuries and he's built on explosiveness, it's tough. I also heard some people say that he was used a lot in stunts to hold up blockers for other people. So maybe that is because of his lower leg injuries and Greg Williams was aware and, and knew that he kind of couldn't have that same burst and, and to kind of beat the guy to get back to the quarterback. So I think this year a healthy Quinn Williams – He'll be used a little bit better. Uh, Greg Williams is going to scheme him in there, and I think that he does have a bigger, better year this year. As like I said, it's just tough when you're in there battling those big offensive linemen and you're not your base is not strong. So, like I said, the biggest thing for him is health. We need to get him healthy. Okay, if you could add four Jets Ring of Honor Hall of Fame guys, five years with the team, to his team, who would you add? So I saw some people asking this, and um, I don't know if it was UV man or, or somebody else. They were asking this with with Ryan and Joe Blewett, and um, I feel kind of the same way Joe kind of felt. Is like, you know, we'll do it. We'll, you know, we have nothing else to really talk about right now, but it's like we can't. So, um, so I would put Kevin Y um, without a doubt. 
I put him at center. I put Moon McGovern to to guard. Um, so how many you want? Four. Revis isn't isn't there yet, so I can't pick him um, because I absolutely would have picked Revis. But give me Klecko because we need we need somebody coming off that edge. Um, I'm trying to think of the names off the top of my head. Uh, I wish I had the list of them in front of me, but man, I'm a Wayne Corbett fan. So I, I'm going to say, give me Wayne Corbett. That guy's tough as nails. He's going to teach these young wide receivers how to play the game the right way. No, not Mangold. Um, I, Kevin Y was better. I love Nick Mangold, but Kevin Y was better. Um, I still remember watching clips of highlights and from in the game too, they showed when they would show the highlight from behind the end zone. And you see a toss or a sweep out to the side with Curtis Martin. And, you know, Kevin Y was one of the best at pulling out there. And he would just clean people. Yeah. But, yeah, Skrekka was. Uh, he was just really, really good at getting into the pasture, though. Um, so that's what I meant by that, Todd. Don Maynard would say a wink, but. Yeah, yeah, probably Don Maynard because um, we do need another, you know, another weapon for Sam. But it's it's an interesting topic to go through. So it's it's just tough because it can't happen. So it's like you get your hopes up, wishing that these guys are here. That's what I'm saying. Like, imagine if we had Revis and Cromarty with the safeties that we have now, right? It's like, but then when we had Reeves and Camardi, our safeties were good, but not not great, right? Now we have great safeties and good, but not great corners. So it's always tough to get it all together at the same time. Two and name has been mentioned in the same sentences. <laughs> if he's Bob Greasy. Freeman McNeil, yeah, he was – Curtis Martin, I mean, but we have we – have, um, we have Bell, so as long as we have an offensive line – I mean, Curtis Martin – I think he's better than Bell, but um, it's almost like redundant, you know, to bring him in there um, with the talent. You know, we already have enough talent in that position, but Kevin Y, like I said, was probably, I think he was the best center to ever play. Um, maybe, maybe because he's the best center I've ever seen play, but Kevin, Kevin Y was unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, but yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong. If they're in the ring of honor and the hall of fame for a reason, they were very, very good players. So you bring back any of those guys, you can't go wrong. I said, Wayne Corbett for me is just a fan favorite. And he was, I almost went to Hofstra because of Wayne Corbett and because of the Jets practice in there. My dad was out in Long Island at the time. I used to go um, to the training camps all the time. I lo loved the campus, loved Corbett. And, um, actually applied there got accepted and just decided to go elsewhere because I wanted to play football. Um, get Mo Bob. I mentioned both because both were highly rated quarterbacks coming out of Alabama with huge injury concerns. Now too. Yeah, guys. So we're a little 10 minutes after 10 here. So if you didn't hear me in the beginning of the video, I'm going to be coming out with a new series. Um, I guess Lights wants to make it difficult on me on the first video, so I'll start with the offensive linemen. Um, we're going to compare AFC East teams and rank them one through four in all different position groups. So make sure you you're stay tuned for that as the first video will probably come up in the next few days. And we will be back again next Sunday at 9 again, hopefully a little bit more audience because I think the Jordan documentary is now over. Um, I know a lot of people are probably going to watch that as well. So I think this Sunday was the last one, but I really appreciate all you guys come out, man. Like I said, it's a lot of the same people every Sunday and I really appreciate it. You guys make my Sunday evening uh, a little more fun to be able to just sit on here and talk about the jets. So um, like I said, look out for that first video to come out later this week. And I'll see you guys back on Sunday. Jet up.